Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Newman Catholic Community for our Whittington Lecture. First of all, a little introduction to ourselves. We are the Catholic Campus Ministry here at the University of North Carolina, for those of you who might be visiting from other places. Some very practical things. The restrooms are directly in the hallway over there. Always an important thing to know. On the way out, if you're visitors, we'd like to give you a copy of our annual report so you can get some sense of what we're doing here at Newman, which is both a parish and a campus ministry. So we embrace kind of the full generational spectrum. That's us and who we are. My name is Friar Tim Kulbicki. I'm a conventional Franciscan friar. I'm the pastor and the campus minister here. The lecture is the Dave Whittington Endowment which was established for the purpose of educating and developing faithful and spiritual Catholic leaders, like yourself, in business, education, sciences, and the community by providing funding for lectures regarding faith and spirituality. And I'd like to acknowledge at this point, Dave Whittington's sister, thank you very much, and her husband. The way we'll go this evening is Father Heft, will present for approximately 45 minutes, and then I'll stand up and moderate conversations, questions, comments, answers, etc., etc. A little brief about him. He's a priest of the Marianist order with a doctorate in historical theology from the University of Toronto. After many years in faculty administrative post at the University of Dayton, which is owned and operated by his religious community, he founded the Institute for Advanced Catholic Studies at the University of Southern California in Los Angeles, where he is the Alton Brooks Professor of Religion and President Emeritus of the Institute. He has a very broad intellectual interest and in publication record, including the Catholic intellectual life, interreligious dialogue, Catholic secondary and Catholic higher education, and the Crisis of Contemporary Religious Disaffiliation. He's published over 170 articles and book chapters, and it is the author or editor of 13 books. The title of this lecture is his penultimate book on disaffiliation or non-affiliation in America, and his last work is a serious study and challenge for Catholic universities and college, colleges, in fact, He's just come to us from a meeting of the Association of Catholic Colleges and Universities in Washington. His service includes on the national boards of the Conference of Christians and Jews, the Association of Catholic Colleges and Universities, and the United States Conferences, Conference of Catholic Bishops Education Committee. He's the recipient of five honorary doctorates, and in 2011, he received the Theodore F. Hesburgh Award from the University of Notre Dame for distinguished and long leadership and service in Catholic higher education in the United States. A very impressive resume, a very interesting man with whom I've enjoyed the last 36 hours or so of visit. And without further ado, Father Jim Heft. Thank you for that uh, generous introduction. I might add that Tim is a terrific uh, host. So we have had, uh, those hours have been a real pleasure. Four years ago, I was talking with a colleague of mine, an internationally known social psychologist. What's a social psychologist? A sociologist studies groups, a psychiatrist or a, a psychology person deals with individuals. A social psychologist tends to work with individuals and groups. I think the distinction is not sharp, but it's there. And we were talking about the growing number of young adults who no longer affiliate with any religious organization. And it's not happening just to the Catholic community. Realizing that the reasons for the trend are complex, we decided to organize under the auspices of the Institute for Advanced Catholic Studies a serious interdisciplinary study to examine it. Now, 
to give you an idea of the seriousness of it, I would just mention this, it cost $80,000 to do it. You have to provide research support. You have to support scholars, as I will explain, in a context for four days, not reading papers. Everybody read the papers beforehand, and we debated each other's papers. So we brought together quite an interesting group of people from a variety of disciplines. Up until this study, most studies of disaffiliation have been written either by sociologists, some sociologists of religion, or by people in the religious sphere. Um, none has done a serious interdisciplinary study. Um, we thought it would share, shed a lot more light on, on the problem. It says, we invited historians, political scientists, gerontologists. You might be surprised how many older people are unaffiliated. Um, philosophers, theologians, developmental and institutional psychologists, theologian, Catholic parents of young adults. We had several Catholic parents of raising kids. Old and young, men and women. We asked them not only to draft papers, we also asked them to come together for four days to discuss their papers with each other and then revise them in taking into consideration what they learned. Now, if any of you, I know some of you are academics, there's a lot of talk about interdisciplinary work. Interdisciplinary work is very hard to do. It's not an easy thing at all. And promotion and tenure systems rarely reward it. But it's significant. And, and it, it eventually, you know, there are new fields that emerge because people have done this. Neuroscience came out of a couple of fields that finally they emerged. We uh, asked them to re revise their papers. And Jan Stetz, the social psychologist, and I, we co-edited the volume and contributed individual chapters. We wrote an epilogue summarizing what we thought we had learned and what we thought could be done to address and even reverse, if possible, the trend. One of the anonymous reviewers at Oxford University Press, which published the study, really praised the research. He thought that was great, but he thought too many of the authors tended to be biased in favor of affiliation. Well, it was the Institute for Advanced Catholic Studies who were running this thing. <laughs> Please. The authors, by the way, included six Catholics, two atheists, two Mormons, one Episcopalian, two Protestants, and one kind of, I'd say, agnostic. We chose these people because they were really good in their fields, number one. And number two, we chose them because they were interested in the topic. You can be an atheist and realize that religion is a major factor in society, and trying to understand it would be an important thing. So they, they were a wonderful group we worked with. We defended our bias, Jan Stetz and I did, and told the editor that in the light of that criticism, we would ask every contributor, many of them social scientists who prize objectivity, you know, they just report. They don't make evaluative judgments. So we asked them all to write a slight epilogue, a short conclusion to their chapter, saying whether they thought this phenomenon they were studying was good, bad, or a mixture. One person said, I'm not doing that. I said, you're fired. No, I didn't say that. But we find, and, and that I think provides some of the most interesting part of the study. I think the, uh, the book offers, I'm trying to sell the book, but I think it offers one of the best studies of this phenomenon. In, in a moment, I'll return to some of the more specific contributions this volume makes to understanding disaffiliation. I want, however, to begin my presentation with three stories, all of which are true. Quite a few years ago, I was giving a talk. I don't remember the subject. It was quite a few years ago. In Cleveland, my hometown, Cleveland, Ohio. And there were maybe 200 people in attendance. And during the question and answer period, one of my former University of Dayton students raised his hand to ask a question. 
He was a bright individual. After graduation, he had gone to receive a law degree at the University of Michigan and was now serving in the Attorney General's office in Cleveland. He asked me, how do you keep hope given the state of the world? My second story is about three young Catholic adults in their late 20s. This is more recent. All of them had gone through 16 years of Catholic education. None of them was currently practicing. That afternoon, they had just returned from playing 18 holes of golf. They loved golf, and they were good at it. So we were sitting on the deck of a friend's house in Arizona, enjoying a few drinks before dinner. I asked one of them, I asked them all three actually, if they had ever heard much about the growing number of young adults who no longer affiliate. After an awkward silence, one of them said, yeah, yeah, I, I've heard about it. I asked them why they thought that was happening. My third story is about a bright student I met recently at USC. She was, as we say, raised Catholic and was majoring now in biology. She stopped attending church once she came to USC. She told me that she trusted science much more than religion. She thought there was no way to resolve with any certainty the different claims of different religions <clears throat> and no longer wanted to commit to a way of life based, as she would say, on opinion. The Bible, she said, often contradicted science. Now, how should committed Catholics think about these stories? And how might one respond to these stories as a committed Catholic? I will return to these stories later in my talk and offer some suggestions and describe what I did say and how it went with them. But first, I want to describe what now is widely reported about the growing trend of non-affiliation among young adults. So the most recent Pew study, December 2021, reports that 29% of Americans are unaffiliated with any religion compared to 16% when they conducted the survey 13 years ago. By the way, Catholics in the United States continue to constitute about 20% of the population. Nearly one third of American adult, adults pray reg, rarely or not at all compared to 18% in 2007. On the other hand, the majority of the unaffiliated young adults believe in God and still pray. That's why we don't use the word nuns, uh, N-O-N-E-S, because it suggests they're nothing. That's not true. Now, I'm not taking great encouragement out of the fact that they still believe in God and pray. It depends with the strength of our culture how long that will last apart from some type of institutional support. Among their age group, 18 to 29 years of age, the percentage who no longer affiliate has risen the fastest. It now stands at 36% who do not identify with any religion in particular. Now look around here and see the young people and treasure them. They're here. Our interdisciplinary study, however, documents a much more detailed, informative, and contextualized description of disaffiliation than this general picture provided by the Pew Survey. And, and the Pew Survey it usually gives you a sketch of mainly young, white, affluent, well-educated persons, much like the kind of young adults I, talk, I talked with in the three stories I just told you. Let me briefly list some of the findings from our own interdisciplinary study. The unaffiliated includes immigrants, when you think of the Hispanic community, that by 2050, by many estimates, would con will constitute 50% of Catholics in the United States. And so many of them are not in Catholic schools. 
It's a separate kind of question. It says, they are not, uh, the, 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 we, have, we studied their non-affiliated theists who do not belong to this group. They're elapsed Catholics and elderly people who for decades have not affil affiliated with any religion. It's typical that when the parents aren't very devout, the kids will drift off. And it also happens when parents are very devout, some of the kids end up very devout and others drift off. It's a complex picture. The unaffiliate also includes high school, uneducated, and economically struggling individuals who make up a quarter, a quarter of the unaffiliated young adults and are less liberal, civically involved, and trusting that they're more than their tr more affluent, educated peers. Under the general category of young adults who are secular, we can distinguish between atheists, agnostics, and non-affiliated theists, believer in God. Atheists and agnostics tend to be young, not married, and childless compared to non-affiliated theists. Moreover, some lapsed Catholics who have drifted away still identify as Catholics, but rarely attend church and make up more than 10% of the U.S. Catholic population today. While one in five Americans are Catholic, nearly half raised Catholic leave the church, but only 10 to 15% return. The idea in the past was well, once they get married and once they have kids, they'll return just doesn't seem to be bearing out to be the case. Social psychology studies how people change their identities and what impacts their identity and makes them, um, in particularly, what they call identity theory in that field. Some of you may know about it. And that was the specialty of Jan Stetz. She did some interesting study of these changes. So those are just some of the findings. Our study also provided some good news. We documented, and this may have been the reviewers concerned about a bias, we documented how religious parents raise religious children, typically, especially if they are authoritative, but not authoritarian. There's a difference. Authoritative means to speak with a kind of inner conviction, but not cram it down anybody's throat. And they also have an atmosphere of warmth and love in the household. I mean, this is, this is not rocket science, huh? I, I made that statement in a sermon. I don't know if this ever happened to you, Father Tim, but a couple of years ago I made a statement in a sermon I gave, this is not rocket science. I happened to be an uh, aerospace engineer was in the congregation. And I, he waited for me at the end of Mass, and he introduced himself. And I said, hi. He says, you know, Father, rocket science is pretty simple. The real problem is getting the rocket to go where you want it to go. <laughs> so I have not brought myself to say this is, this is not rocket engineering. It wouldn't have the same impact. We document religious parents, especially if they're authoritative, provide warmth and appropriate religious structures. You know, I would say just as a mantra, no structure is absolute, but some structure is absolutely necessary or else we go to sleep early, we, don't, we, don't, we waste our time, and a community is crucial in supporting that. And space for appropriate autonomy, graduated as they get older. We also document how fostering religious development in youth protects against delinquency, violence, depression, and anxiety. You think that would be enough to keep people in church, but there is a lot of data on this. In short, the healthy practice of religion, starting in families, fosters psychological and physical well-being, as well as civic involvement, to say nothing of the possibility of salvation. The volume includes chapters by two married women, non-academics, who are raising young adults. They recommended involving young adults in leadership in the church, getting them involved in parish councils, doing this kind of thing. Make sure that you tap into their insights. They also recommend intergenerational mentoring. Universities, except for rare contact of a personal type with a professor, 
is a peer group interacting with each other. You know, it'd be much better if there was more intergenerational give and take. The, the, the people that do the best in universities often have been able to, to form a good relationship with several of the professors. And the professors take the time, and this is a great gift when they do this, to mentor them. A greater emphasis on relationship, friendships, belong, rather than belonging out of obligation, and providing more substantive intellectual development in understanding their faith. I mean, after all, kids are getting into very sophisticated sets of understandings about the world and all of that, but their faith can remain often intellectually weak, and that can help. Though in the last analysis at the core of faith, as you will see in a moment, is not intellectual insight, it's love. In short, our volume offers a multifaceted and detailed understanding of the complex reality of disaffiliated young adults. What are some of the reasons why disaffiliation is happening? For Catholics in particular, the reasons most often mentioned include, not surprisingly, the secularization of the culture, the sexual abuse scandal. I find this upsets more adults older Catholics than it does younger ones who kind of go, yep, of course, again. In uninspiring liturgy, boring homilies, the church's stance on LBGT, women's ordination, abortion, artificial contraception. If you notice, these are all moral issues. These are all moral issues. One of the best ways to get a perspective and a grip on dealing with moral issues is a deeper appreciation of the creed and what that means. To respond just to debates about the moral issues rarely takes it to the next level. So some people blame Vatican II. There's some truth in all of these reasons, but there's also complexity on how best to understand them and how much weight to give them. Allow me to take a closer look at three of the reasons that are typically given. First, what is this business of secularization? For a long time, social scientists believed that Western culture was on an irreversible path to secularization and the disappearance of religion. Until the 1960s, most social scientists assumed that our modern age would make religion irrelevant. Capitalism, industrialization, democracy, pluralism, the impact of the sciences coupled with the wonders of technology would, they thought, make it obvious that Nietzsche was right. God is dead. Or at least he's no longer needed. It turns out that religion has not disappeared and God is still alive. However, the forms that religion takes today typically have changed. Most Catholics in North America now practice what I would call a privatized form of their faith. In other parts of the world, I can talk about that more if you want, but in other parts of the world, for example, sub-Saharan Africa, where the church is growing faster than anywhere else in the world, South America, and even in China, religions are thriving, especially in Pentecostal forms. It's estimated over half a billion people have been let on fire through Pentecostalism. More on that later if you want. Except in China, these various forms of Christianity have influenced and can influence public life. Even in Western culture, certain forms of Christianity have had considerable political impact. For example, the Solidarity Movement in Poland when John Paul II was Pope and the religious right in the United States that elected a couple of our presidents. So secularization has not snuffed out religion, even though in certain parts of the world, it's become a mostly but not completely private matter. The privatization of religion means that the significance of traditional authority has declined, coupled with people increasingly making up their own minds about religion and morality. In short, the influence of religious leaders and organizations 
have sharply declined. Our exaggerated individualism leads me to remind my students that while they alone should make up their minds, they should never make them up alone. Second, what about Vatican II? Did it contribute to disaffiliation? Some Catholics deeply attached to the Latin Mass and to traditional forms of piety target Vatican II and often the current Pope as two of the main causes of disaffiliation and confusion. However, if Vatican II is the culprit, then it is hard to explain why Catholics have retained a higher percentage of their members when compared to mainline Protestants, such as Presbyterians, Methodists, Episcopalians, Lutherans, none of whom ever held a major gathering like Vatican II. British sociologist and theologian Stephen Bullivant locates the beginnings of disaffiliation earlier than Vatican II and locates it right after World War II, especially in Europe, describing the 1950s as a breakout decade that fostered what? Fostered greater social mixing, the baby boom, increasing educational opportunities, certainly true with the GI Bill here in the United States, um, town planning and suburbanization, growing prosperity, sales of cars and television, new architectural idioms, and much else. In the 1950s, scholars in Europe and the United States were already warning of a falling Catholic attendance. Pope John XXIII called for Vatican II early, in early 1959 to address several major challenges, including this loss of membership. So, if secularization really didn't cause religion to dis disappear, it is also hard to argue that Vatican II is the main cause of disaffiliation. Notre Dame sociologist Christian Smith has done more research on religious life of young people and young adults than any scholar I know. After surveying high school students, he described their morality as moral therapeutic deism, MTD. Moral ther what does it look like? First, God exists who created and orders the world and watches over human life on earth. Second, God wants people to be good, nice, and fair to each other, as taught in the Bible and by most world religions. Third, the central good in life is to be happy and to feel good about oneself. And fourth, God does not need to be particularly involved in one's life, except when God is needed to resolve a problem. Fifth, good people go to heaven when they die. That's MTD, Moral Therapeutic Deism. High school students whom Smith documented who think this way often think and look like deists, not Christians, deists, meaning they believe that a God exists, but God is not Emmanuel, has become one with us, and so on. It says, Often, when they graduate, they no longer affiliate. It seems that most of them have yet to confront the problem of evil that leads people to wonder whether God does watch over human life. They also seem to be satisfied with a God who remains distant and cares about them only when they are in need. Over the years, I have often felt, this is a personal opinion, that most academics studying this phenomenon tend to put the blame for disengagement from religion on right-wing Christians and some of the Catholic teachings on sexual morality and gender. On the other hand, most religious leaders point a condemning finger at secular culture and its materialism and relativism. I think that academics, on the one hand, would do well to develop a better understanding of religion in all its complexity, and the, on the other hand, religious leaders could recognize how, in too many instances, their own behavior and leadership has contributed to the problem. Let me return now to my former student who asked, how can we keep hope given to the state of the world? When he asked that, 
I asked him a question. How do you know the state of the world? He replied, well, you know, watching CNN and reading the New York Times. I replied, I remember this vividly, why would you ever assume that CNN and newspapers give you a balanced appreciation and insight into what is really going on in the world? I went on to explain that I think what should be obvious, namely, that most of the media focuses, even obsesses, on violence, scandals, war, murders, potential wars, weather disasters, and so on. No media, I said, has covered our meeting. And I don't think there's any media here tonight. And we're trying to do a good thing. It's not interesting. It says here, I, 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 so I went on and I said, what, what is really important is that we really need to evaluate more carefully what we are fed by much of the media, not all the media, but a lot of it. I can't tell you how many people over the last two months of COVID, I've recommended that they fast from media because they get so upset. This trend of disaffiliation is serious and it is alarming. However, it would be helpful if we had a better sense of history. Christians have been in some very rough situations in the past. Our addiction to breaking news obliterates a historical perspective. Personally, after every breaking news story, I would love to see the media present a story on enduring truths. That would make a real difference. History puts contemporary crises in perspective. Enduring truths sustain us through tough times. A close reading of St. Paul's first letter to the Corinthians reveals, reveals the magnitude of the problems that the young Christian community had been struggling with. Now just picture this. What? It says, incest, rival leaders, prostitution, divorce among Christians, lawsuits, idolatry, concerns about women praying and prophesying in immodest ways, chaos in worship with people speaking in tongues and competing voices, inequality in the communal meal, and denials of the bodily resurrection of Jesus. First letter to the Corinthians. I'm not making this up. You should read it. We also have a great story from the turn of the 19th century when Napoleon was ravaging Europe. A bishop ran into the office of the Vatican Secretary of State, then Cardinal Consalvi, and said, Your Eminence, the situation is very serious. Napoleon wishes to destroy the church. To which the Cardinal replied, Not even we have succeeded in doing that. <laughs> now the situation was serious. Picture this, in, 19, in 1799, Napoleon invaded Rome, captured the Pope, and put him in prison where the Pope died. I don't know how many of you knew that. Then again, 10 years later, he captured the next Pope, Pope Pius VII, put him in prison for five years. Put the Pope in prison for five years. He survived and continued as Pope for nine more years. Towards the end of the 19th century, St. John Henry Newman wrote with typical eloquence and perhaps some rhetorical exaggeration the following. The whole course of Christianity from the first is but one series of troubles and disorders. Every century is like every other, and to those who live in it seems worse than all times before it. The church is ever ailing, religion seems ever expiring, schisms dominant, the light of truth dim, its adherents scattered, the cause of Christ is ever in its last agony. <laughs> but here we are, all together as we sing your song, joyfully. These notes from church history should give us a bit more confidence that we will make our way through the current trend of disaffiliation. Numbers will be smaller, no question about that. But they'll probably be more convicted and dedicated. Christianity began with 12 people, one of whom betrayed Jesus, 
and hung himself. Ten fled at the critical moment, and one remained at the foot of the cross with his mother Mary. This is not an auspicious beginning to a world religion, but it came. We could give another whole talk about the power and the role of the Holy Spirit, but I'll leave that go for now. Allow me now to return to that conversation with those three young men. There was that awkward pause. Remember when I asked the question? I didn't say anything. Then they started to list some of the causes of disaffiliation, including, once again, lousy sermons, some of the church's teaching on sex and gender, but also now being very busy with their professional lives and families. Two of them were married, and one of them had two children, two young children. After a pause, one of them added, you know, sometimes it's just plain laziness. Since it was obvious that they enjoyed playing golf, I asked them, how did they get good at it? They said, well, you, you practice. And I said, well, how do, you, how do you get even better? They said, well, you, you practice more. And I said, if you want to even get better than that, what would you do? He said, well, they, you'd get a coach. And they could see my line of reasoning kind of coming in here. And I would say, you know, religion is not that different than golf, at least insofar as practice over a period of time, getting mentoring, it becomes deeper, it becomes more real. I could feel a bit of discomfort in our discussion at that point. Uh, they found more joy in their friendship and golf than being an active participant in the church. For one of them, I think it's begun to, ch begun to change a bit. But After 16 years of Catholic education, why were they putting more energy and time into golf than into religion? All three of them are good people. They are good people. What happened? There's no simple answer. Each of the three would have, I would imagine, different stories despite their similar educational experience. Does Catholic education keep young adults Catholic? What was their parish experience? Did they have a good campus ministry as they have here? I would imagine that there are multiple explanations. Let me now turn to my third and last story. I'm referring to the USC student majoring in biology who believed that science and believed in science and found religion a matter of opinion and the Bible conflicting. Bishop Barron, who a number of you may know, has said that he thinks that science is the number one cause of disaffiliation. I'm not sure I agree on that, but um, what might one say to people who think this way? The first thing is to marvel and thank devoted scientists for their breakthrough discoveries. For example, recently, genetics and neuroscience. And like many people, I await the important astronomical discoveries possible with the Webb Space Telescope launched just recently. It's fascinating. For Catholics, the problem should never be science. Modern science is a marvelous practice that explores in empirical detail critically important issues that lead to better health, communication, and travel. It is, after all, mainly the scientific community that has alerted us to the urgent need to address the destruction of the environment. The problem is not science. The problem is scientism that belief that science is the only form of reliable knowledge. Some have gone so far as to claim that religion and philosophy are useless. The recent physicist Stephen Hawking made that comment. Very bright and also very narrow, very unfortunate, a real scientistic kind of comment. Scientists, as scientists, are unable to address some very important questions, such as, what is the purpose of my life? What is the meaning of suffering? Does God exist? And if yes, what difference does that make? Any scientist who claims that science proves that God does or does not exist goes beyond what the scientific method is capable of measuring. There is no empirically based proof either way. There is, however, evidence sometimes compelling for those who are attentive to more than empirical measurements. Modern science is not the only or even the most important way of thinking. After all, people of great wisdom 
lived long before the arrival of modern science. Today, I see very few university courses devoted to the study of wisdom. What professor would dare to do it? What is wisdom? It would be really a worthwhile, not just the book of wisdom and the scriptures. Rather, many universities now advertise themselves as laboratories for critical thinking. This is a buzzword and a lot of it. However, critical thinking without a moral framework can create a successful crook or a skillful political manipulator. So critical thinking without moral guidance is dangerous. People who think that critical thinking is the only way to think are not thinking critically. If they were, people would not, if you always thought critically, there's a phrase in theology called the hermeneutics of suspicion, where you're always interpreting things, saying mm, this could be you know, a power grab, something. If people only thought critically, they would never get married. They would have no friends. They, they would not make the act of faith. We talk about faith and reason. Faith is a certain point where you come and say, I believe and I trust and I can't prove this. Those of you who are married, could you prove that you made the right choice when you made it? No, never mind. We're not going to go there. <laughs> Yeah, that's a pretty good record, so I'd say hang in there. Another type of thinking, every bit as important as critical analysis, is the kind of thinking that leads to making wise commitments. The best protection of our dignity and our freedom as persons is to make wise commitments. That's paradoxical, but that's true. The best, uh, for Christians, the deepest meaning of life is based on trusting and welcoming God's love and forgiveness, which is experienced in a personal way in and through Jesus Christ. That's core. The Bible teaches that deeper wisdom. My biology major never learned that Bible is not a science book. Rather, the Bible is, as one author famously put it, about the rock of ages, not about the ages of rocks. The, to, the read, to read the Bible correctly, one must pay attention to the genre of the particular text, a skill that's taught best through theology and the liberal arts. People do not read the front page of the newspaper in the same way they read the editorial or the classified ed or go to the deep truths of the comic page, which I never miss. <laughs> Reading the Bible intelligently requires understanding the literary genre of the text. For example, there are two creation stories in the book of Genesis, and they don't agree. Now, were the Jews dumb? Or did they know these were not to be taken literally, but they were to be taken seriously? Because the creation stories tell three things that are very important. Everything that is is from God. Therefore, everything that is is good. And third, people screw things up. It's very clear from the beginning of the Bible. To offer another biblical example, it helps to realize that Job was not an actual historical figure. Then Christians are able to apply the truth of that story. Good people suffer, and, and, and it's not because they're sinful. That's the truth of that story. Better than if they imagine that God sometimes makes a deal with the devil to determine who really is devoted to him. Think of, of uh, Jonah in the belly of the whale. That, that's, that's a myth. What's a myth? A myth is not a fiction. A myth is a way to tell a deep truth. And there's a lot of that in the Bible. I'll give you one example. Maybe you've heard this story, very short story. Two young monks walking a day's journey from one monastery to the other. At noon, they come to a small river. A beautiful young woman was standing there, very well dressed, obviously wanting to go across. So the one monk gathered her up in his arms, carried her across, put her down, and then the two went on in silence for the next four hours before they were arriving at the monastery that was their destination. At that point, the monk who didn't pick up the woman said to the one who did, Brother, I, I don't think that was very prudent of you to pick the woman up the way you did and put her across the river. The other monk replied, I put her down at the other side of the river. You're still carrying her. 
Now, if you ask the question, is that true? Did that really happen? It happens all the time. But you have to understand the genre. To ask if it's really true, in one sense, it is very true. And it happens a lot, the Good Samaritan. You can think of any number of stories like this. Finally, the biology major mentioned that religions were just matters of personal opinion. Well, there are many opinions about religion, but religions are not based on mere opinion. They are based on the experience that believers have of life and wisdom and God. I've been significantly involved in interreligious dialogue for the last 20 years. If anything, along with the greater appreciation and respect of other religions, I've deepened my own understanding and commitment to Catholicism. I believe that the more deeply persons live their religious traditions, the greater is their capacity to understand and respect people who believe differently than they do. My experience is similar to that of Houston Smith, who grew up as the son of Methodist missionaries, became a famous student of world religions, and in 1958 published his widely praised book, The Religions of Man. He never abandoned his Christian faith. In fact, in an interview just two years ago, before his recent death, he explained that religion gives traction to spirituality. He did not find uh, depth in spiritual but not religious movement. He added, it is good to have grounding of perceptible depth in one of the religious traditions. And he put it this way, I love this. If you are looking for water, it is better to drill one 60-foot well than 10 six-foot wells. He also suggested that the deeper one goes into great religious traditions, the more one finds wisdom and compassion. The deeper the roots of the tree, the more it can withstand strong winds, bend without breaking, and survive droughts. Depth and flexibility are important. They are, in my experience, found together. I'm not going to talk much longer. I have a couple pages, but it is time to bring these remarks to a close. I've documented the growing number of young adults who no longer affiliate with any religious community. I've described the complexity and characteristics of disaffiliation. I've listed some of the reasons scholars offer for disaffiliation and discussed their plausibility. I've recommended that we avoid much of the media if we really want to know what's important, affirmed the value and the limits of the scientific method, and suggested an educated way to read the Bible. I stress the importance of knowledge derived from making wise commitments. And finally, and most importantly, I have located at the center of Christianity the encounter with Jesus Christ in and through others, the sacraments, and the activity of the Holy Spirit. There are other important elements to this story, including the importance of family and spiritual mentors we might want to discuss, if you like. I conclude with this. The great historian of Christian spirituality, Bernard McGinn, Chicago, was recently asked if he agreed with the remark that Karl Rahner, a leading theologian of Vatican II, made when he said in the future, Christians will either be mystics or cease to be anything at all. They'll either be mystics or they'll just wander off. McGinn agreed and he said, unless a Christian religion is lived from the heart, from the experience of God in some real way, it will be empty and will not be attractive. If it's purely institutional in form, or even if it's an interesting intellectual exercise, it doesn't have the vitality that comes from the interior experience of the presence of God. Put in a slightly different way, I believe that Catholic communities, which do not foster spiritual experience, that teach only abstract ideas, and hold uninspired rituals will continue to contribute to disaffiliation. It's not necessary, however, to choose between spirituality and religion, nor between spirituality and the intellectual life. Houston Smith was right to remind us that religion gives traction to spirituality. The way forward for Catholics, then, requires faith communities that are schools of spirituality and believing communities that foster wisdom 
rooted in Catholic and intellectual traditions. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Father Heft, for some stimulating thoughts. And it's time for some questions and answers. Raise your hand, I'll kind of MC this and I'll repeat the question just to make sure that everybody can hear it and particularly for the taping. Yes. Just to repeat again, is the disaffiliation crisis of religion also to have something to do with people having less trust in institutions generally? I think so. I think that's a fair comment. You know, I have, I have nothing to add to that. Good point. I'll put you in the last part of the paper. <laughs> that's good. Okay, while people are thinking, I'll take a stab. Uh-oh. Yeah. You told me you wouldn't do this. I'm going to do it anyway. Um, in, in some of your research, in some of your studies, you talked rather hopefully about perhaps we're in the middle of a second axial age that people we might not sense. Could you give some background to that? I mentioned this in my chapter. I got assigned the last chapter of the book. It was not easy to write, mainly because we're in a period of more transition and change in my reading of history than we have been for hundreds of years. For a long time, the assumptions with which the church operated was, anytime there was a majority of Catholics, the secular government should support the Catholic Church and were required to do that. Never talked about religious freedom. Vatican II comes along and affirms the separation of church and state. Not the separation of religion from society, but the separation of church and state. It also affirms religious freedom, which is not freedom from religion, but freedom from coercion in matters of religion. So it worked on these, and they're, they're carefully worked out. And it also said you shouldn't shun Protestants. You should dialogue with them. And not just Protestants, but Jews and Muslims too. In the recent past, for some of us of a certain age, you don't even go into a Protestant church, right? You don't do that. Some of you have been foolish enough, like my mother and father, to marry a Protestant. <laughs> and I am, for one, grateful <laughs> that they did get married. So all of this, especially if you think of the Reformation, 16th century, the defensiveness, French Revolution, the desire to make sure that we presented orthodox teaching as exactly as possible, the preoccupation to make sure people avoided heresy, and then we come along and we say this, and I think it was necessary to say it. Is it any wonder that we're now in a period of 70 years of trying to figure out how to sort this out? If you don't have a high tolerance for ambiguity, it's hard to be... Now, is the creed up for grabs? No. That's why I said before, you might have all these questions about sexual matters and so on. I believe in Jesus Christ. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, communion. Repeat these, understand these, embrace these, and love these. And that'll at least give you a frame of reference to deal with all this complexity. So I think we're in a period now, and the great historian John Henry Newman said it, any great church council can take as long as 150 to 200 years to absorb. Council of Nicaea, 325, condemned Arianism. There were Arian bishops, the majority of the, Ameri the, US, the Catholic bishops in the world. There weren't any U.S. bishops in 325. The majority of these bishops were Arian, and it took over 100 plus years to eventually get them out. So, fact that there's confusion and difficulty? 
like the tree, go deeper. Go deeper. An encounter with God, a sense of God, and especially the absolute incredible center of Christianity, the God-man, Jesus Christ, who died, rose, and in whom and through whom we live in a way that's unimaginable. G.K. Chesterton once made the remark, if you can believe in the incarnation, you can believe anything. Which is another way of saying, don't lose sight of what's at the core. And even if you're confused, you can continue with some confidence. Yes. Great question. So the uh, question again is, has COVID accelerated or contributed to this crisis? It has. There's no question about it. When, when you realize that you don't go to church and you don't go to hell right away. <laughs> but, uh, you know, and then and the other thing is you can shop around for more channels. And you can get, you know, a couple of really good ones. You say, why should I go back to this one? No, no, no I didn't mean that that yeah. way. But you know what I'm saying. So the answer is yes. In Washington, I heard a marvelous talk by the Surgeon General, Vivek Murthy. And I mean a marvelous talk. And he talked about the loneliness. If you just talk about the COVID deaths, as it's affected children, over 150,000 children have lost parents. And I'm not even talking about grandparents, parents. It's, it's a profoundly difficult time. If there's ever a need for more community, it's now. And we're not sure whether we can shake a hand. Or, you know, I'm, I'm glad I asked Father Tim, can, can I remove my, my mask for I, when I want to speak? Because it, I, I teach at USC, and I have all these students. You know, my hearing isn't as great as it used to be. Uh, this happens to a number of us of a certain vintage. And students mumble, sorry, and they wear masks. I mean, it's like teaching a group of bank robbers. <laughs> it's not easy to hear, and a teacher needs to really be able to do that. But I think we're hurting. At the same time, it sorts things out. People that dig deeper come back, and they can actually bring even more to the table, though fewer in number. I've seen that. Yes. Father, um, the community term disaffiliation, and it was kind of a fancy term. But to me, it means drifting away. Or maybe it means, in terms of the younger generation, they're not really into organized groups as much as my generation is. They don't, uh, they don't affiliate as much. And so therefore, the future of the church has to be maybe a little different. Um, siblings, my brother drifted away, probably feeling the effects of being stoned. My sister has become a devout Protestant because she just thinks that was more relevant to her life than being a devout in Augusta, Georgia. And my other sister has, has kind of drifted away too. And this is after a, a good modeling by my mom and not so much my dad, but my mom. We, we got into the church because we respected her and Moral therapeutic deism, De MTD. That's where they are. They're in their or it could be MTV. <laughs> They're in their young 40s. Yeah. And they think they've got it just about figured out. And they don't need to be church. Right. They really don't need to. Right, church. right. Um, and I don't know how to combat that. I really yeah. don't know how to combat that. They're good kids. They've had their children. Sure.
Love them. Love them. Love them. Yeah, but let the kids, let the kids. Well, beyond what you're doing, I mean, I don't know what else to do but to stay close to them. Every time you have a conversation, you don't say, why are you not going to church? Don't do that. Find ways to speak about your own faith that's not oppressive. I think the big problem, when I say the problem is privatization of our religion, that means most of us don't have an active vocabulary where we can talk about our faith in a way that's effective, e even like with your kids saying, help me to understand, what is your experience? I'd like to know what it is. Not like I'd like to convert you, but let, let's what happens is parents don't even want to bring it up because they feel like it's sensitive and they don't want to be nags. And the other, kind, the other side of the coin is you've all met some real evangelical people that come up and said, have you accepted Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, have you? And we say, oh my God, I'm, the, Catholic, the Catholic tendency to do that is about like this. <laughs> That's what the privatization of faith means. So our problem is to figure out how to live it in such a way that people are going to say, Boy, I wonder what makes him tick. I wonder why she acts that way. And that's through deeds and love. And you know, you say, that's not rocket science. But it's hard to do. And patience, and don't beat yourself up. I'll give you one last story for me. In 1981, we had a new superior general, a Spaniard. He was really intense. All Spaniards are intense, I find. But. <laughs> I was, I was upset about something. I don't know, it was in Toronto, Canada. I was there at the time. And I remember telling him this, oh, blah, 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 stuff like this. And he was sitting there and he goes, I thought, uh-oh, I don't think he's pleased. He said, you cannot get discouraged. Why are you discouraged? When you are discouraged, you're useless. There's no reason. You can't help anybody. So get over it. And I remember saying to myself, damn, he's right. <laughs> <laughs> that was the cold shower I really needed. <laughs> Don't beat yourself up. Find ways to give and to love. And you may see it in your lifetime, you may not. I was going to meet tomorrow, I told Tim this, up in, I'm going to be speaking at St. Michael's College in Vermont. Um, <laughs> and there was a, a, a young guy I had, he's now 58. He argued with me as an undergraduate, went into Peace Corps, great guy, not religious, but he's got two sons and they're deeply involved in campus ministry. He says, go figure. <laughs> so I was hoping to see him tomorrow and he sent me an email earlier today saying he got COVID, so I'm not gonna be able to see him. I haven't seen him in 30 years. I will, I'll see him somehow. Love the guy. Okay. John and then the gentleman here and then Connie, I think, right, John. Do you what, want to repeat yeah, it? Yeah, where are we moving to if the second actual, actual age has happened? Everybody likes to ask historians to predict the future. So, <laughs> Yeah, uh, those of us that are my age, I'll be 80 next year. We were told that if you didn't go to Mass on Sunday, it was a mortal sin. We were told a lot of things were mortal sins. And most of us kind of come to the conclusion, a number of them really aren't, all right? So what we had was an external structure and a Catholic subculture. You lived in a Catholic neighborhood. You wouldn't think of marrying someone, except you're a rebel like my, my mother and father were, who was not also Catholic. Today, I have five interreligious marriages coming down the pike that I'm gonna be working with over the next year. I mean, interreligious, Muslim, Hindu, Buddhist, and Catholic. So what's gonna be the difference? The difference is going to be I think, and it's already, you can see signs of it, what I was alluding to at the end was a deeper core experience of God as real. 
that moves the person to be part of a community and to service and to some type of public witness. A smaller group, but it's going to be more vital. And I hope that's not a pipe dream. I don't think it is. I see it already. Think quality, not quantity. We go from there. And my guess is, since you are here, you're part of that group. But go deeper. Last Sunday was go out into the deep, the gospel. And it's one of my favorite ones. Go deeper. You might say, well, I don't know if there's anything there. Good. Go anyway. Get a golf coach. Get a spiritual coach. You just quoted my homily. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. That's, that's quite all right. I'll, tell you, I'll take the quote. Carl, now that you pulled the mask out, I could see it was you. Great question. Okay, let me just, a little out loud so everybody can hear it, especially for anybody live stream. While there is disaffiliation among young people from religion, there often is very deep commitment to social causes, such as Black Lives Matter and the climate crisis. And what's the importance then, why should they, why should they or we be concerned about a disaffiliation from religion? That's a great question, and here's, Here's one thought. I don't know that I have the answer, but I have an idea. And, and the idea comes from some people I've seen. I was talking with a couple of good young people earlier today over at uh, that other place. <laughs> Duke. <laughs> and I made the comment that, I, relax. <laughs> I made the comment that um, Catholic social teaching on these kind of issues, on the environment, on justice and economics and all these kind of things. And, and these are the kind of things you're talking about these people commit themselves to and work on it. They're pretty idealistic. And when you look at the real world and Catholic social, there's a gap. And one of the things I don't think the church has done well enough is to find a way to educate young people in leadership that sustains them in trying to make these changes. Because the, the vast majority, in my experience, after a bit of trying to do this, a bit in the Peace Corps, coming back, feeling disoriented when they try to share their experience, people not really interested, they, they just kind of wed themselves to society and they continue. And they're good people, but they get a good paying job and they move on. So what's going to sustain them it's got to be something deeper at the core. The source of hope that one guy said, we're, we're, you know, how do we keep hope? The fundamental answer is, for a Christian, I have hope because in my fragmented, splintered self, I am forgiven by God. And I do my best, and God loves me even as I am. And at the end, it's not just death. It's new life. It's transformed. As we get older, and I can speak about this, we all think more about death. And it can be a source of anxiety. It can be a source of fear. Or it can be, this is going to be a very interesting transition, and what a new adventure. I know religious people who face this. You probably have faced it in dealing with some of your own members and communities where they have doubts. It just, you know, is, it, is, is what I'm being told real? There's the corpse there at the funeral and, well, go back to the core. I believe in the resurrection of the dead. That's something that these people, if they continue to strive, as I would hope they do, 
on their issues of social justice, they've got to reach deeper. Otherwise, it's going to be hard. And that's true of Muslims. It's true of Jews. They, 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 I've talked with people. They, they have to have some spiritual, I was talking about at the end, some spiritual experience that is real enough to say, even if I fail in this effort, that's okay. What's important to me is do the right thing. I don't want to give the last word to Spike Lee, but doing the right thing is important. Connie. Great, great question. Yes, we do okay, have some just, data on that. Just it. for everybody to hear, is there any gender difference in the levels and rates of affiliation, disaffiliation? Yeah, the answer is yes, there is. And what you find is a growing disaffiliation in the Catholic Church of young women. And you find atheists typically are men who have graduate degrees. This is why you hear a statement to the effect um, that, gee, the most educated people, graduate degrees, PhDs, the highest number of atheists. And they say, how could that be? Well, it's very easy, because a lot of graduate ed education educates you out of religion. It educates you out of religion. It never engages you on a deep intellectual level as a graduate student with the fascinating questions about life, death, and purpose. And they're brilliant people over the centuries who've addressed this, but these people have never encountered or read these people. So I never have difficulty when people, you know, are all really bright people atheists? No. Are a lot more people who are graduate degreed, even PhD, tend to be off the reservation? And yes. But, and this happens to atheists. I mean, this happens to theologians. I've seen it happen to theologians. You study theology because you don't believe anymore. <laughs> I have no interest in that. <laughs> Bob? So about 20 years ago, Robert Putnam put together the first of these three large books, Soul and Alone, and talked a great deal of, and presented a lot of evidence that spanned decades on deterioration, the rise of deterioration of socialism. And part of what his work was in, involved was the first tenets of the notion of this up and down. Okay, the question is, referring to Robert Putnam, who has done a lot of work on the fraying and breaking down of the social fabric in the United States, what is different about this, and is there any similarities, and uh, what can we do to kind of rebuild this? If I summarized you correctly, I think I did. Did, did you read his latest book, The Upswing kind Upswing of thing? Upswing is interesting. Now, I find that fascinating, but I think it's too optimistic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, <laughs> It's a problem. When you really get famous, you start writing books and you think they're all truthful. Um, <laughs> but but I, my, my own sense is, you know, the question you asked about COVID. I, I did something some people would think pretty crazy a week ago Friday. I just hadn't seen my sister in Albuquerque for a long time and her kids. So I got in the car and I drove to Albuquerque 11 hours. And then I drove another seven and a half hours to Tucson to see uh, one of her children and his, that family. And then I drove back to L.A. another seven and a half hours. That's a lot by the following Tuesday. But I really realized how much I miss them. And I think a lot of the deepest problems come from loneliness, from not forming community. We have to really become more skilled at that. That doesn't mean we have a mass on Sunday where everybody's hugging each other. Although that's not bad. But it does, it's the formation of friendships. And C.S. Lewis put it rather nicely in my way, my thought. 
He once said, every healthy friendship is face to face and shoulder to shoulder. Now for most married couples, children force this. I like to say, children make parents into adults. So it's a combination, or in Martin Buby, another one of my great Jewish philosophers made the comment, every healthy community has at its center something that transcends it. So it's this spiritual dimension, when you ask about all this social kind of action people are involved in, eventually they're gonna come to a point where they need to refuel, they need to have some depth. And it's not just me and God, it's a community kind of thing. So I think we've been hurt by bowling alone. That phenomenon is real. And that's why I also feel his latest book, I'm, I'm glad I'll talk to you about it later. I, I just find it a, a, a little too optimistic. He has all these graphs, but no. Tip. Thank you. Okay, just for louder voice, if the trends seem to indicate that things are going to be smaller and more depth oriented, what changes and how will this impact the wider institutional church? It's gonna be lay leadership. Rome still has a hard time and you've had international experiences I have in the church, Rome has a hard time understanding how many initiatives our lay people take and what they do and how they organize the parishes, how they're on finance councils. Try to find that in Italy. That's why I don't like to be lectured by bishops in Italy. I think we have a great opportunity and that great opportunity is going to be a lay leadership in the church, fostering it, deepening it. If you don't take responsibility for something, you don't grow deep in it. I think that's absolutely essential. And it's still a little wobbly. People aren't that confident. Priests don't know how to tap the talent in a parish. I've, I've never been a pastor. I'd probably be a disaster, I don't know. But one of the things I would do, the first thing I would do is, is consult who, what's the talent? Let, let, let me see who, who's got what background. And then I would start tapping on shoulders and I'd ask a kind of election, fill out, these are people in a part of our community. I would make sure there were different age groups. You notice this evening how few young people have spoken. I want you people to step up. Okay. But I do think that the way forward is going to be, it's gonna be smaller, but it's going to be more energized by lay initiatives. Because more lay people are every bit as educated as priests. They may lack certain theological formation and so on, but I can tell you there's theological formation that isn't that worth that much. <laughs> no, no, I don't mean that disrespectful. I, uh, what I mean, I have seen people get a degree in theology and it hasn't transformed them. And I would blame the professors. Been a number of tests, essays, mostly conceptual kind of stuff, but not a kind of transformative experience. It's gotta be both intellectual and spiritual. Academics tend to be intellectual. And if they are spiritual, it's private. We need to bring them together for the sake of the whole community. Okay, Ethan's gonna take you up on a challenge and then Grace, go ahead. Whoa, whoa, go buddy.
Okay, as, as a young adult about to get married, the two of them. Congratulations. <laughs> but, what, but are you sure? <laughs> what, what, what advice would you give to us and our generation for what to do with our children for the next generation? It's a very important question, and it's very existential, uh, actually, for you. Go deeper. Your sanctification is going to be in your relationship, the two of you. When you marry, you know, you minister the sacrament. You're the ministers. Of the, we, we, we priests, we witness it. And up until the 16th century, didn't you have priests there for a variety of reasons? That's an interesting. That's a sacrament that, and, and it renders holy the relationship and all of its strengths and weaknesses and tatteredness. I am immensely grateful to my parents who supported me, who loved me. And they did so right at the beginning of this kind of whole thing. So again, basic advice, live your faith in a way that's not pro forma. After mass, don't say, ah, that was a that sermon sucked. <laughs> That's not going to you know, Even bring any did. joy to your children. It may require you to find a place where you're spiritually nourished. And you may have to drive a bit. Not every parish, parish has that ability. So make sure you're nourished and find places and sustain that. There's a, like one other thing I'd say. A big debate in years past about at what age is it appropriate to confirm somebody. You know, and some people do it early, some do it, you want to make sure you do it before they go to high school or you'll lose them, blah, blah, blah. I don't think it's important. I would say if every year you do not set aside at least a weekend to enter into a retreat context to deepen your faith, you're overwhelmed by work and other stuff. Get your parents to say, look, mom, dad, here are the two little rugrats. I know you'll get tired over the weekend, but the two of us are going to go and make a retreat together. Things like that. That's to sustain the deeper thing in the, in the center. We really have to learn to do that. Now, where do you find these places? A lot of times monasteries do a good job. They're very good on silence, not very good on marriage. But they, you know, there are, there are a number of married people to whom I'd never go for marriage counseling either. I mean, it's... So, those, you know, that's what I would say. And keep in relationship with some people of real deep faith that can challenge you. Okay, and then, and then Grace. Quick follow-up to that. Um, thank you, that's, that's really great advice. I was wondering, could you all speak a little bit more to, you kind of talked about the authoritative and not authoritarian, and that being some of the youth. And I think I would probably classify my parents that way. They're bad about that. A little, a little bit more insight into the authoritative as opposed to authoritarian parent. Yeah, yeah. It's hard for me to get more specific because it is so concrete and depending on the personalities of the husband and wife and how they do it. So to make some generalization there, it would be rather other than what I said. But I mean, the basic idea of what I said is it isn't, when you say it's authoritative, that already in our head, we, we confuse authoritative with authoritarian and they're not the same thing. Authoritative would be maybe better understood that it comes from the center of their heart. And, and there's reasons. There's some good reasons. And it's not because I said so. On the other hand, it's not, please, would you please do it? No. Finding that balance, you know, and it, 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 if you have to correct someone for cutting the cake in the wrong way and they're 21 visiting home, you got a problem. So I, I, beyond that, but I, I know what it means, but I, what it would mean in a, I, I think we could probably talk about religious superiors that were that way. No. Yes. <laughs> no. Let me, let me give you a, one confession if I can. I, so in high school I cheated. <laughs> 
It was the end of my junior year. I had a really gifted English teacher. And I, was, I had a date due. I had to get the thing in, and, and, and I was way behind. So I actually, it was a, no, a three-page type of thing. Sabrina, if you ever repeat this, I'm going to kill you. But what, what, I, what I did was I, lift, if you could, I lifted a paragraph, with just slight tweaks, from E.B. White, a great essayist. Dumb. So I turned it in, got a good grade for the class, summer, blah, 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 come back. It's the same teacher I'm having in the senior year. In the first day of class, he's talking, he's going to teach literature. He says, uh, Mr. Heft, you know, listen to this paragraph. What do you think of it? Let me read it to you. And he started reading it. I go, oh, shit. <laughs> and then he said, it's a really good piece of writing, don't you think? I said, yes. He never said another thing. That was perfect. I never cheated again. <laughs> but he didn't need to beat. He just had a way of doing it. Now, that's authority and warmth. Grace, and then we're getting near to 8.30, so this will be the last question. So again, for, for voice purposes, uh, in certain aspects of apologetics, there seems to be an overemphasis on the intellectual. While that's important and needs to get done, how do we find ways to balance that with a real deep spiritual experience that has both of these things put together? As I said to those three young men, get a coach. A skilled spiritual director knows how to deal with a person that tends to live in his head and knows how to deal with someone who lives in his heart and can coax them to move in a way that's more balanced. What would bother me, and I think you pinpointed this in your comment, if I understood it properly, would be any movement that would say, this is the way to do this. So I know people that centering prayer you know, what you really need to do is practice centering prayer. I find centering prayer drives me nuts. I can't do it. I don't like it. What I do, I saw somebody throw her hand up like this <laughs> in the back. But, but what I do, what I do is I find a combination of reading texts and reflecting on them is very helpful for me in the hour of silent prayer I set aside every day with my community. I remember one person saying to me, I notice you're reading a lot during meditation time. Have you talked with your spiritual director about this? I want to say, get the hell out. <laughs> get out of here. So I, I think your question is absolutely right. Watch out for people that have the formula that will solve everything. Now, some people will be upset with my talk because I didn't give the formula to resolve it. It's a complex picture, and people are complex. And at different ages in your life, the balance has to be different too. Some things that worked pretty well and kept you excited at, at 25, at 70, it's a different picture. So where's the wisdom within our communities that help people at the appropriate age level to keep, keep the balance, and if it gets out of balance, to recognize what it is? I was talking with a brilliant man this afternoon, and he said to me, he says, you know, one of, one of my 
It wasn't Father Tim, but it uh, was. <laughs> Certainly wasn't. <laughs> he said, one of my problems is I don't take time for myself. I, I never take time. I'm, I'm busy. I like work. I do it. You know, I just don't take time for myself. I think I'd be terrible if I didn't have a religious order that structured my time and simply we all agreed we're going to be there and we're going to be quiet an hour every day for that meditation and sing the office. We sing the office. We don't recite it. And then we celebrate the Eucharist. And when we celebrate the Eucharist, all of us share in the reflections, always. It's not just the priest shaking something out of his sleeve. It's really good. And the students come and they participate. These are great questions, great group. I, I don't want to presume more time. You've already given me yeah. more time. This will be our last one. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, yeah. Right, and up in the Northeast, they're closing them. So, did you, I don't think I caught that. Did you mention that? I, I did not mention that, but I nodded yes, because one of the, the people that did the research on history was, was talking, you know, you talk about the culture of the United States? No, talk about the cultures of the United States. And they are changing. What Atlanta was before air conditioning and what it is now, totally different. So, the, the, that's why, you know, Mark Twain said, no generalization is worth a damn, including this one. <laughs> but, but you can say in the Southwest, we're building churches. Here, we're building churches. Northeast, we're closing them. Upper Midwest, pretty tough. Southwest, growing. Northwest, pagan. <laughs> yeah. And Silicon Valley, idiosyncratic. So you're absolutely right. But we have 25 counties in North Carolina without a Catholic church. Yeah, we're still mission territory down here. We'll do something about it. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, just for our closing, uh, I would ask Therese to come up and take a picture with us for the commemorative thing with the donors. And then following that, uh, as you might have guessed, Father Heft is a big-time extrovert, and he's promised to talk to whoever wants to afterwards, as long as we don't tire him out too much. But we'll be available for a little bit of fellowship and conviviality. Uh, as a little bit of, a, of an advertisement, this talk will be on Newman's YouTube channel, probably as of tomorrow morning. So refer it to your family and friends if you found it useful. Has this been taped? Yes, it has. Jesus. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so uh, thank you all for coming. This has been, I think, a very stimulating evening. And on behalf of all of you, I'd like to thank Father Heff for a very stimulating talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, just give us a moment to do photos, and then we can mingle a little bit. Jim, could you? Let's.